Hello, everyone, and welcome to the I Interagency Standing Committee briefing on the emergency preparedness approach in COVID-19. Um, just making sure that you're all in the right meeting by, by showing the white welcome slide. We're going to make a start. It's uh, 3 o'clock, and we have a lot of people who have already joined. Um, please let us know through the chat if you have any issues with um, the sound. Um, otherwise, I'd ask, actually like to request if you are not um, speaking to actually turn off your video so that um, the quality of the connection will be better. And anytime throughout the conference, you may enter questions in the chat box and we will get to them after the presentations. So, good afternoon, good morning, colleagues. Thank you for joining us in the interagency standing committee thematic briefing on emergency response preparedness approach in the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Wendy Q and I have the honor of hosting this webinar today. As you may know, uh, the IAC guidance in emergency response preparedness was made available in 2015. Revisions are still ongoing to update the guidance based upon field experience. However, in response to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the IASC has agreed to adopt the guidance to respond to the, to the demand of the pandemic. In April, the Interagency Standing Committee prepared an interim ERP, Emergency Response Preparedness Guidance. This interim guidance was designed to be a technical step-by-step -step short guide for countries that did not have a humanitarian response plan. The guidance was designed to help UN country teams develop or strengthen preparedness measures so they will be able to address potential non-health humanitarian impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And also it's a compound effects on existing risks. This interim guidance was based on the 2015 IAC ERP emergency response preparedness guidance. So in this webinar today, you will hear more about this interim guidance, updates on the broader work um, of the IAC on emergency preparedness and how emergency preparedness guidance is being used in the field, specifically in Bangladesh. Today, we're fortunate to have with us John Long and Dr. Asen Rahman. Um, John is the head of OCHA's Emergency Response Preparedness Unit, and Asan is the executive director of the Dhaka-based Dhaka Isania Mission, a multi-sector national NGO in Bangladesh. So first, John will brief us on the key aspects of the Interagency Standing Committee Emergency Response Preparedness Approach and the adapted interim guidance for COVID-19. And Asan will provide some valuable field perspective on how this preparedness approach was applied in Bangladesh. We'll then open the floor for discussion and you'll have an opportunity to ask um, questions or share some comments. So welcome, John, welcome, Asan. Um, I don't see you, but I'm sure your videos are on. Um, thank you to both of you for agreeing to brief us today. Let me first introduce John Long. Uh, I'm going to ask others to mute their mic if they're not um, a presenter. So I'm, let me first introduce John Long. He has long experience covering both political and humanitarian affairs with the United Nations, the European Union, and in the private sector. In addition to serving as the head of OCHA's Emergency Preparedness Response Unit, he is also co-chair of the Interagency Training Committee Preparedness, Early Action, and Readiness Subgroup. So over to you, John, to um, provide the first presentation on the ERP approach. Thank you very much, Wendy. I hope everyone can hear me well. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on what part of the world that you're in. Um, so today I'll keep my remarks relatively short. What I really wanted to do is just to give all of you uh, a bit of a background of the ERP itself. And then as Wendy had mentioned, to go into a little bit of detail in terms of the interim uh, ERP guidance and uh, how we see that being implemented. Before I start, uh, as Wendy had mentioned, um, we have had for uh, the best part of 15 years or more now, uh, an interagency, uh, different groupings called subworking group, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're now part of results group one, uh, which is basically a group made up of focal points from all of the, the key IAC partners that over the years have come together to work on developing guidance around preparedness and readiness, but also being more active as well in terms of supporting 
uh, colleagues in the field as and when required uh, in terms of mission and support. Uh, for results group one, there are two sort of key outcomes under the sort of risk and preparedness uh, banner. One is in relation to early warning, and there's a separate analyst group uh, led by WFP that I think most of you will be familiar, uh, issues the IAC early warning, early action report on a six monthly basis. Uh, the group that I co-chair uh, along with uh, my colleagues from UNICEF uh, looks at the emergency response preparedness component. We work very closely uh, with the uh, analyst group to ensure that every early warning that we look at from a point of view of what kind of early action, readiness uh, or anticipatory action uh, activities that can be recommended. As part of our brief, one of the things that we do is to ensure that the uh, ERP has been updated. So through the course of the last year and a half or so, we've been working on updates of the ERP. Um, and that's something that I think is well reflected in terms of the interim guidance, which I'll, I'll go into in a bit more detail. But just by way of background for those who are not maybe overly familiar with the, the ERP approach itself, uh, as Wendy mentioned in 2015, uh, the IAC uh, adopted the, the ERP guidance as the key overarching guidance for interagency preparedness. And I think that's a key component to take into consideration when we're talking about the ERP. Uh, it is very much designed for coordinated responses. Um, and so it brings together a whole range of different sectors and different partners to work together. And under that then, of course, are all of the different agency and organizations own preparedness activities that support uh, that overall uh, coordinated interagency effort. The key consideration for the ERP and why the impetus for designing the ERP came about was that for many years, as many of you are familiar, we had a very much a contingency plan based approach. So a lot of our preparedness was around uh, a large, in many cases, often an unwieldy uh, document um, that, to be honest, was never really serving us particularly well. There were too many instances where people never really referred to the contingency plan. So in and around sort of 2012, 2013, different agencies started looking at better ways of trying to do preparedness and readiness. And the approach that underpins the ERP is very much a response focused approach. So everything about the ERP is trying to look at different types of humanitarian responses and to understand what makes a good response. And therefore, what are the steps that you need to take in advance in order to ensure positive response outcomes? We can probably jump to the, the, the first uh, key slide. So, what we looked at was rather than focusing on a plan, we decided that we would need to develop a more of a framework uh, for overall preparedness and readiness. In 2015, how that looked was under three kind of key components uh, on risk analysis and monitoring, obviously is a key fundamental starting point in terms of preparedness. In particular, what we tried to emphasize in the ERP approach was the whole issue of monitoring. Uh, again, it was something that was recognized as a bit of a gap that while country teams were good at identifying risks, they weren't necessarily uh, dynamic in terms of the follow-up of those risks and monitoring them from a decision-making point of view. So that was one key sort of change element that was brought around with the ERP. The next and probably the biggest kind of change was the whole issue of minimum and advanced preparedness actions. Again, going back to that response focused approach, what we tried to do was to break down response into its different components, whether around coordination, operational uh, activities, uh, linkages, et cetera, et cetera. And then to identify a set of key questions that country teams could ask themselves in order to analyze what they had in place and what needed to be in place. And again, we'll get into that in a, in a little bit more detail as we go forward. And then finally, as you see, we still incorporated contingency planning because it is still a key component. But again, the emphasis here was that rather than doing generic plans, that we very much focused on specifics. In other words, if we didn't have a clear understanding of the specific geographical area or the specific population that might be affected by the risk, then what we wanted to do was to not develop generic plans, but wait until we had more specific detail so that our plans could be very much an operational based plan. So those are the sort of the three core elements that 
took us forward in terms of this framework for preparedness. So if we can move to the next slide, the, the key issues, and this I think we come back to time and time again, because this is ultimately the underlying philosophy of the ERP, is that it needs to be realistic. Um, again, we look across the world, there is different capacity from country to country. Uh, trying to have a one glove fits all approach is not something that we saw paying ourselves dividends. So one of the key elements was a realistic approach based on the existing capacities and trying to maximize those existing capacities of humanitarian partners in a given country. Uh, it needed to be very practical. Again, it always needs to focus in terms of the operational response. And the reason for this is that one of the things in the analysis of developing the ERP that we recognized was that in many respects, the biggest contribution of the humanitarian community in response is in those initial number of weeks in the, for want of a better term, the, the truck it and chuck it uh, part of the response where we can actually plan in advance for it because we can anticipate a lot of the types of activities that we'll do in that first uh, three to four weeks of an acute emergency phase to buy us time then to do the types of assessments that need to be done in order for the more medium term programming and obviously in terms of the early recovery type activities. So again, that issue of focusing on that practical element was a key element around the ERP. And what we've been developing over the last number of years is how we break down those practical components in a bite-size, easy to do approach uh, at the field level. A third element is in terms of the flexibility. And again, going back to the no one glove fits all situation, what we really wanted was that this be contextualized for the different context and used in a very flexible manner. And again, in a few moments, we'll see how that's happened uh, across the board. The coordination obviously is a key element in terms of being able to coordinate with the different activities that are going on, whether that's you know now in terms of you know when we talk around the nexus, but actually ensuring that we are linking up with development partners, we are ensuring that the response is in line with the national response that's going on, that we are working with different partners in different sectors. So again, that's another sort of a key element of the flexibility of the UAP approach. And last but certainly not least, and probably the most important element is the whole nationalized or localization element of this. One of the key things that we have seen, and I think we all recognize is over the last 10 or 15 years, the way international humanitarian response has moved. Uh, the UN, for instance, is no longer necessarily on the front line of directly delivering assistance. Many large international NGOs are no longer doing that. And instead what we're seeing is more and more that it's local organizations and local communities themselves that are the first responders. So ultimately, a lot of the work that we look around the ERP is how do we work and support the activities of local organizations, local NGOs? And we've made progress, but we still have a lot to, to move uh, along that line. And I think in terms of the next presentation, we'll hear a bit more with regards to that. So if we can quickly move to the, the next slide. So just quickly, and I'm not going to spend any time on this, but one of the key successes, I think, for us over the last five years is that the ERP is now used in about 69 countries around the world. Uh, it's used in different formats. There's different elements, but the core elements of the risk analysis, the capacity analysis, the identification of key preparedness are all similar across these countries. And we've seen you know, over the last five years, the success of this in different types of response situations where by focusing on the practical, we see that it actually survives the initial shock of the response and pays dividends in terms of actually having pos positive uh, response outcomes. We can move to the, the next slide. Um, again, you know, just very quickly to touch upon, again, the notion of flexibility is that the ERP can be used in all different types of contexts and is used in different types of contexts for all different types of risks, whether they're complex emergency or natural disaster, because again, the same fundamentals uh, apply to all of these different situations. The difference that we see is obviously around capacity, where we have you know, full-blown humanitarian operations, have an awful lot more capacity to do an awful lot more uh, themselves within uh, the confines of countries, whereas smaller country teams with less humanitarian capacity 
might be very much focused on the soft side about working with local partners, making sure the relationships are there, and then setting up the mechanism that international aid can come from a regional or global level. So we see all of those different types of uh, approaches under the, the broad umbrella of the UOP approach. If we can then maybe move um, to the, the next slide, because what I really wanted to do, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll jump forward again if uh, to, to the next one again, because I think what I'd like to use is just the last couple of minutes uh, is just to really go through the interim ERP uh, approach uh, for COVID-19. Um, hopefully, most of you have had an opportunity to, to go through this. Uh, as Wendy had mentioned, we had already been in the process uh, within the, the subgroup of revising the ERP approach, very much just based on best practice that we had seen from the field, trying to encapsulate what we have learned over the last five years into uh, clearer guidance for uh, the revised ERP guidance. Obviously, you know, then we got hit by the, the COVID-19 pandemic and we saw that it would make sense for us to put out a slimline version of what we were already uh, planning to do in the revision. And so what the interim ERP guidance is very much uh, aimed at is to complement the work that's been done by national authorities, which has been supported uh, by WHO uh, in terms of looking particularly at the, the, the public health uh, approach to the pandemic. What the ERP approach is to try to look mainly at the non-health humanitarian impacts of those and help country teams to do a very quick analysis. So the two key components that we're looking at with the interim ERP guidance are maybe new uh, humanitarian risks that are emerging because of COVID, uh, as well, and I think this is a really important element of looking at the existing risks. Unfortunately, we now need to re-examine all of the existing risks that countries face from the perspective of COVID. How will that change the way in which we might be able to respond to that risk if it materializes? So what we have in terms of the interim guidance are five really key steps, and the guidance has been laid out hopefully in a very practical manner uh, for country teams to be able to ask themselves these questions uh, and move forward. We have the whole issue around coordination, again, particularly so because of the different coordination networks and systems that have been set up for COVID. The risk uh, and risk protection analysis, and again, trying to really bring out as well the whole issue of, of risk protection, which we really want to, to highlight in terms of this guidance. And in this, what we tried to do is to, to put together a set of very practical questions that country teams and partners can ask themselves as they examine and re-examine risk at the country level. The third step, based on the, the resources. So again, what we've laid out here in the interim guidance are some kind of key questions that country teams can go through in order to do that prioritization process if they already haven't. And we know a lot of country teams have done that in different uh, guises. The fourth step, and this is sort of, again, a crucial sort of the key component around the ERP is the whole issue of capacity analysis. Coming back to that practical response focused approach of the ERP, what we've again tried to do is to break down uh, that capacity analysis to allow partners to ask and answer those kind of questions in terms of what is the capacity they have, have things changed, how will they respond differently uh, because of COVID, if they are you know, have limited access, if they have to work from home, et cetera, et cetera. So again, that range of different practical operational questions. And then the final step, which is based out of all of the, the four steps, is to look at what are the critical gaps. So if we've identified prioritized activities, we've gone through what our capacity is to implement those, then what are the key gaps that need to be filled in order that we can then fully operationalize uh, our response uh, to those prioritized needs uh, if required. Um, and again, that is the kind of process that we have been looking at seeing happen across the globe at different country levels over the last number of years uh, in different guises. Um, we've had a lot of experience from the Asia uh, region, which I think has done a huge amount of moving forward on the thinking around this. So those sort of five steps are the thought process that we have as well with the revised ERP guidance, which um, we'll probably bring out at the end of the year. I think we'll use the interim guidance uh, until the end of the year and hopefully 
uh, learn some lessons for that as we go forward. Um, that I think kind of wraps up what I really wanted to bring across uh, today, but then uh, there will be an opportunity for more questions later. And just the, the final slide, which I think will be shared with all of you, is just where uh, you can get the, the guidance and get follow-up information. Thank you. Uh, so back to you, Wendy. Thanks, John. That was a very um, comprehensive briefing, and I'm sure there'll be some questions later that we'll come back to, um, delving into a little bit more detail. Um, and I'd like to remind you all to participate if you have some questions or comments that you'd like to share through the chat box. We're now going to hear from Dr. Ehsan, who will tell us about how local actors are applying the ERP approach in Bangladesh. Ehsan has more than three decades of experience at the national and international level in his work to strengthen community resilience capacity in Bangladesh. He has been a key contributor in the effort for the localization of humanitarian actions. Um, Jiwan, if you could just go to the next presentation, so he's going to be, begin soon. Um, so in addition to being the executive director of the Dhaka Asanya mission, Esan is also the chairperson of the National Alliance of Humanitarian Actors in Bangladesh. So I'm going to hand the floor now to Esan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, good evening from this part of the world in Bangladesh. Uh, and also good morning who are starting the day and good afternoon who are around the center. Uh, I echo with uh, John, he uh, made the background quite uh, easy for me to bring uh, the discussion to the ground level. Uh, a number of time he mentioned about this uh, adaptation, this uh, generic how really the generic guidelines can be contextually made appropriate and what sort of specific initiatives can be taken what happens at the country level where the disaster or any emergency situation occurs uh, uh, as i say took okay, a good evening from here is the same greeting we need to talk uh, uh, the good morning good afternoon uh, because people are in different part of the world uh, here lies one example how really contextualization become very important. Uh, again, if we take the example of IESC, what John has mentioned, that okay, his journey, he mentioned about, uh, he gave us a precise background how it started back in 2015 as an ERP preparedness plan, and then gradually now in COVID, it need to be interim guidance prepared. Uh, so there have been changes and uh, over years and in preparing this interim guidance we uh, we could contribute in the formulation as well as in the through our feedback so this came for use for covid perspective uh, so this is another uh, example that leads us that look okay, at any a generic document, any global document or macro level document even at the national level we prepare that need to be contextualized. So my whole presentation is contextualization of this ERP from the localization perspective uh, perspective uh, in Bangladesh. The, in the next slide, I will be giving a brief about what uh, Undi said. I am representing the uh, National Alliance of Community Adapters. In the next slide, please. Uh, this is a platform where, uh, uh, next slide, please the National Alliance of Humanitarian Actors in, in Bangladesh where is a, a forum where we promote localization. You work collectively with other networks also in Alliance. Uh, we jointly work on a couple of issues. Uh, uh, sorry, the slide is not moving. I, uh, I would request you to the person who is uh, handling slide to move to the next slide, please. Uh, as the uh, so, uh, no, it's uh, one. Uh, it already you cross two. Oh, sorry, the, the before one. Yeah, this is uh, this alliance really uh, particularly focus on the networking and partnership. And in John's presentation, also in ISC coordination become as an issue across uh, both at the macro level and micro level. Uh, so, in my presentation, I will be uh, picking up some of those issues which have been uh, stressed upon in the ISC as well as on which we work in Bangladesh. Next slide, please. I start with the uh, COVID scenario where the national organizations 
we collectively could do when this pandemic started in Bangladesh. This is a response making made by the four humanitarian actors in Bangladesh, uh, where with their own resource, uh, they, they could start the response. Uh, and on the other map, you see for how Nahab we uh, are for institutionalizing localization in different disaster prone area. We are trying to develop some demonstration districts so that at the local level, the practice can be uh, demonstrated. Next slide. Uh, in the in this slide, you see, as I mentioned, the okay, NGOs as the first responder, how really they risk the people uh, with their own resource, whatever less. Uh, you can see that later on the donor fund came, whatever amount is there, the figures are there, but important for us to show you that the, the whatever local resource they have in cash or kind, they jumped up onto risk to the people. In the next slide, you will see uh, the people we could reach through this uh, uh, initiative, uh, combining with the donor support in all eight divisions, uh, 49 districts we reach and 212 uh, NGOs work. Uh, this is the scenario until uh, mid-May. You can see the number uh, of people we could reach through this localized initiative to the families, to the individuals, uh, and that gives an indication. This is one anecdote I, I want to start with the beginning. And thanks to the humanitarian actors in Bangladesh in different parts of the country uh, for joining this. And it, even in the this lockdown situation, we uh, virtually, through virtual communication, we could collect this information. This is not all because we couldn't reach all. In the next slide, I will be talking on this uh, issue of coordination. Uh, what really in the IAC have been given to us emphasize how really we are working with the government, with the UN system, uh, and also with the INGOs. Uh, the uh, platform humanitarian coordination task team is there that is more or less common uh, in all countries. The, we, are, we could become member of this ACTT, so we could participate with the international organization. That is one area where we could, even on the COVID response uh, planning, uh, the need assessment planning, we could work together. This is uh, the need assessment issue, this uh, need assessment working group work together where more than 50 organizations, national, international, and uh, UN organization, we joined hand when we could make analysis, what is the extent of uh, need uh, and the uh, pandemic reach is there in one in the, uh, I'll be sharing with you later. Uh, and also in the response planning, the UN and the government, how they could make for this uh, uh, cyclone response, Ampan, which affected uh, recently after even on the top of COVID, how that came up. Uh, so response planning, uh, we also could contribute to some extent. Uh, then at the inter-cluster coordination, there have been cluster initiatives on WASH, on health, on education, on different uh, uh, development intervention. All clusters could work and there have been cluster level coordination among the organizations. What we are now targeting through this localization roadmap, uh, what they are, how there can be district level coordination among the actors. In the next slide, you will see some of the documents uh, that uh, we could come up with this. The first one is there's a background document, uh, uh, the state of humanitarian actors uh, actions in Bangladesh 2019 of uh, version Nahab could develop, uh, could publish it and it is available and it has background material. Christian has circulated it. You will get a scenario where different organizations contributed. Uh, the uh, scenario, baseline scenario is there. In the second map, you see the how this need assessment working group who could come up with a comprehensive uh, coverage of the national scenario, where this one mapping is that the number of COVID confirmed cases and where the intensity of each attack. The third one is regarding the cyclone, cyclone Ampan. There have been a need assessment group again work together and what is the extent of damage. Uh, so these are the examples of uh, coordination and uh, which contributed to the planning. The last one on the uh, extreme side here, it is, it, this is the ACTT contingency plan for the climate resilient disaster in the COVID context. So you see in Bangladesh, now the situation is not only natural disaster, which has been long, 
Now COVID came, and as well as the other context, you know, Rohingya scenario in the uh, southern part is there, Rohingya crisis is there. So we need to deal whole ISC uh, guidelines from the perspective of all these different contexts, uh, what uh, John already mentioned, and I want to flag up that aspect. In the next slide, uh, I will be sharing with you from NAHAP as a national uh, alliance, how really localization can be grounded at the field level and our roadmap is there so that uh, uh, the local level organizations can contribute in raising alert uh, in many in decision making in allocation as well as in response. Uh, in, the, in the later stage, I will be sharing with you how that is being practiced. So the whole capacity issue, the whole partnership issue, pool funding issue, all those are in the ISC. We are aligned with that and uh, this helps us to contribute to the localization planning at the ground level. And other aspect I want to emphasize in the next slide, I share with you how really the accountability framework we are working currently on so that our collective accountability to the local people, the affected people remains there, whether we are local actor, whether we are government, national actor, international community, whoever, uh, the, our at, at the end ultimate accountability is there. So that is the one basic spirit we want to uh, give emphasis in the localization roadmap. At the next slide, as I mentioned you, that how really at the local level uh, responses could be made through participation of the national organization, uh, also international organization through a consortium mode. This is one scenario of the flood response where the NGOs could raise alert as part of start fund, Bangladesh full fund, uh, uh, management mechanism where we all are we are the members there so they uh, we could raise alert there are many group of organizations who could participate in the decision making process and there have been collective response in the mode of consortium where the national organization sometime led uh, in one flood scenario in other area where the local organizations they led uh, in the current covid scenario also that example is there that uh, uh, this consortium uh, modality that work, as well as in the cyclone Ampan, we also see uh, that works. Uh, so that is one strong strategy emphasized in the IAC, and also we feel that at the practice level, that is uh, 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 that can be a good strategy to ensure that the local organizations can respond immediately after the uh, crisis. Uh, in the next slide, I will be talking on this, how really the pool funding or whatever mechanism we call the partnership become an issue and in partnership principles, all those have been discussed in this guidelines. I'm not going into that. I'm just to flagging up from our practice perspective, what are the, what are the hurdles to develop partnership when we are talking about national, international, uh, organizational partnership. Uh, there are uh, these of the issue have been discussed all along at the both national and international level. The process of developing partnership, the assessment tools, technique, uh, the individual policy of the organizations, and there are variants in the organizational culture and modes and context. So these are the area we need to address when really we need to talk about the viable uh, partnership. The next one is about uh, the how really we see this area, please, uh, in the next slide. Uh, the key issues uh, that we want to emphasize uh, when we talk about this uh, contextualization or uh, partnership or the full funding, the alliance building is uh, and working together is a key approach which have been emphasized in the ISC. And we also feel that at the country level, that is more, the more we have the coordination, both at the national and local level, the more we can uh, achieve there. And that can be in the need assessment scenario, in the designing the localization, contextually appropriate, whether it's a COVID, whether it's a Rohingya, or this is a natural flood situation or cyclone. Accountability framework we need to put in the middle. And above for the resources, we want to give emphasis on this full fund mechanism with transparent and accountability assurance both at the national and subnational level and that would ensure the partnership values that have been emphasized uh, in IAC. I just stop my presentation here. Thank you very much for your patient hearing and be open to the questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Esan. So um, we're now going to open the floor for any questions or comments, any participants wishing to come in at this time. Um, and maybe I'll also check uh, with Jiwan if we had any questions coming in on the chat. If you'd like the floor, you can either uh, signal in the chat to um, put your name and your organization or um, perhaps just raise your hand. Uh, there was a question from John during his briefing. Um, it was, if you could just um, explain again the three different levels of country. I think it's about the country preparedness or the approach is different in three types of countries. If you just um, answer that question, please, John, over to you. Yeah, uh, no problem. I, I don't think necessarily we're talking about about three different levels, but the, the point really more being is that what we see with the ERP implementation is that it's being implemented in a whole range of different country contexts uh, so that we have countries which are very much sort of development orientated that have limited humanitarian capacity who use the ERP to focus on the key issues that they can do within their capacity and maximize that right the way through to the sort of full on humanitarian operations where obviously the capacity is much greater. Uh, again, I think the point was just to emphasize how flexible uh, the approach is. Over. Okay, thank you. I see that Annette has um, her hand up. Um, can I give the floor to Annette, please? Thanks, Wendy, and thanks a million, John. Listen, we kind of all, I suppose, need your guidance. Most of us are dealing with very complex and complicated settings where the people we're trying to serve have multiple drivers uh, in terms of their humanitarian needs. How, you know, using the format as it now is, how can we kind of best orientate or guide given the multi-dimension risks now, further complicated by COVID. I mean, just to share with you, in Northwest Syria, where um, the cross-border team based in Turkey deal with, we have ongoing deaths as a result of H1N1 influenza, as well now as the threat, there's no cases yet, but the threat of COVID. This comes in a context where we have ongoing conflict, we have um, malnutrition rates that haven't been seen in this area for quite some time. You have a very limited capacity in terms of the response potentially with um, a, a cross-border resolution that may not go ahead from the 10th of July. How do we kind of make those priority decisions trying to leverage what comes from our, um, using the, the updated ERP? Thanks, Million. Uh, there's a question to me on can I respond? Yeah, uh, uh, John Park. Yeah, you mentioned uh, ask about the major challenge of COVID uh, and how we could work. And one example, yeah, uh, COVID really brought a big challenge for uh, for many of us as a densely populated country. Uh, we started uh, facing that from Mars. Uh, at the macro level, I say we didn't have enough preparedness for it. Uh, so there are issues. That's why the transmission level is going up stream, and we don't know where it would be ending. One particular issue we address from our organization, the Kaseni Mission, our health team, uh, they took preparedness uh, since it started, the crisis started in China, uh, to train up the, our health people uh, and also uh, arranging the personal protection kits for them so that our intention was that the regular health service do not get affected. That we could assure uh, uh, we have 43 outlets for health services to work closely with the local government. So, so far we could continue retaining that. Uh, that is one part, but the other challenge is still big challenge remain the, uh, the increased level of contamination 
uh, we need to work on that, how there can be increased test, how there can be increased facility of uh, uh, people, uh, uh, treating people, though there is no uh, still the treatment uh, devices available, but at least how really uh, uh, manage the people's awareness level so that they can uh, they keep safe distancing. That area we could not still address. Government is trying to go for zoning uh, based on this pandemic effect. I don't know what will be. Thank you, Aysan. Um, I want John, if you want to add something to that answer in response to Annette's question. And then we do have um, another question, a couple more questions I want to get to before our time is up. Yeah, so very briefly, yeah, thanks, Annette. I mean, you clearly, you know, you're in one of the most complex situations, but there, you know, we're seeing this across the board and particularly now with COVID adding to the complexity already. I think what we've tried to do within terms of the interim guidance is to help on a, a kind of a step by step to be able to break down some of these complex issues. Obviously, I think you have a, you know, in the context you're in a clear, a much clearer understanding of what you know what you're facing but then it's in terms of how to prioritize that and in many respects you know that's i think what we have tried to emphasize with the practicality of this is that you know how we prioritize is based on what we can do and what we have the capacity to be able to do at the first instance and i think that's probably the first fundamental question to be able to ascertain what capacity we have and also now added on top of that the complexity of covid and from there, I think you can kind of, you can build out sort of saying, okay, look, we know we can do X, Y, and Z, but that doesn't fully address uh, the key humanitarian needs that we have. But at least then we're identifying what that Delta is and then looking to how we can maybe look beyond just the capacity uh, that you have locally uh, to engage others, both at, at regional and global level. So there's no real clear answer to that, as you know well, but it is, I think, from experience, that aspect of breaking these things down into their, their key components and looking at them from a very practical perspective. And that's what I think we hope uh, the guidance helps to do. But, you know, again, it's a set of, of questions and hopefully as part of going through those questions, more things will occur uh, to you, to your team on the ground as well to, to address those. But again, I am also happy as well to, to have a, a bit more of a longer discussion offline and some of the things that maybe we can support you with over. Thanks, John. I see that Danielle had his hand raised. Uh, Danielle, did you want to come in here? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, thanks for this. It's been, it's been very interesting. The, the, the here uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, which we call rapid, it's very similar. Structurally, I think some of the be being put into the new guidance. But I mean, I, I, I think maybe some reflections from the panelists. I mean, one of the shifts that we've seen with COVID um, has been the need to, to, to build in even more flexibility. I mean, we'd always gone for sort of straight contingency plans, case scenario, you know, we're gonna have a huge earthquake. What do you do? The assumption that we can modify a, something smaller, you can adapt all those preparations to it. With the additional level of COVID and the fact that we're dealing almost by definition with multi hazard, multi layer situations, whether it's conflict and disease or disaster and disease are all three. I mean, we've been trying to play around with ways to make it more dynamic and flexible. So, uh, I mean, in the presentation, they mentioned the Bangladesh um, contingency plan. You know, that was uh, something that, that we've supported where, again, you had a trigger based system for what emergencies would trigger humanitarian response. And then we built out a modular package with all the partners, including local partners, um, that would build in the COVID protections, but also give you a range of things that let you respond dynamically to the way the situation changed. And it was, it was more work up front because a lot of planning, practical planning had to go in at the cluster and agency level. But I mean, with the re recent cyclone Amphan, we were able to turn that around into a response much more quickly in a way that maintained the COVID sensitivity uh, and let the other parts of the COVID plan continue on a separate track. Um, and I mean, I guess it'd be interesting to hear some thoughts about, you know, what is the, the level of complex 
complexity here and, and how can we optimize this as we move into a situation where all of our contingency plans are going to be multi-hazard in the sense that they're at least going to be COVID plus whatever else you're doing and are most likely going to be COVID plus food insecurity plus socioeconomic shock plus cyclone plus conflict, et cetera. Um, but uh, yeah, over from my side. Great, thanks. Uh, did either of the panelists want to come in on that? Otherwise, I just want to add a question that we received from uh, Zhengji, an FAO. He was asking about the impact of the movement of restrictions caused by COVID-19 on humanitarian actions and how local humanitarian actors um, have been able to continue uh, working despite these restrictions. Is it difficult to negotiate with the states and how can we prepare perhaps uh, to facilitate access in this situation? Maybe I'll start with um, with you. Ethan, would you like to come in on that question? Yeah, I, uh, I was uh, going to respond to the earlier question on the complexity issue, just giving one example. In the need assessment working group, when they started with COVID effect, and then since the, our disaster season, cyclone and uh, flood season is coming up, what uh, we, we could do there uh, is a uh, analysis of the disaster effects over the last couple of years and then poverty in the uh, parameters, then the COVID uh, contamination level, all those, and so making all those com uh, composite, uh, com combining all those, there could be a composite need assessment we could do. And so that is one example that, okay, it needs to be taken care of because it cannot be, either of those cannot be taken in isolation. In the chat box, I'm getting one question about this local level planning, how really the uh, NGOs can work. In Bangladesh, this there is a standard order of disaster management and also our disaster act made a provision for working together at the uh, district level and all the actors together. Unfortunately, that is not uh, always uh, practice for the national disaster management it works to some extent but for this COVID one we have been advocating that okay those need to be taken care of uh, so that the, uh, unless all actors join together no kind of joining will help thank you great thanks um, just for everyone's knowledge the um, Danielle is with the uh, regional office of OCHA in Asia Pacific uh, John did you want to add something at this stage just, I mean, I think very briefly, I mean, you know, both in terms of the question that Annette had asked and then from Daniel's follow-up, I, I do think this is sort of the core of the issue when it comes to what we're seeing with the COVID-19 pandemic is this uh, complexity. And that, again, as Daniel had said, you know, what we're looking at is sort of multiple scenario development. And that's something I think we mentioned as well within the interim guidance is that need to understand that we are looking at this in a number of dimensions, what may be true for the next number of weeks may not necessarily be true in two or three months time when a risk that we're looking at may materialize. So one of the things we're starting to see, um, for instance, now in terms of the hurricane season uh, in uh, the Caribbean is to have multiple elements in terms of here's the situation if we can get surge staff in, here's the situation if we don't. So again, it, it is more complex, but I think it is a necessary component of what we need to do. And ideally, again, sort of trying to, again, keeping it practical, it may be a additional work, but, you know, I think it's something that can be done in a relatively short period of time uh, with teams on the ground with the right sets of questions. And I guess one of the things that we're trying to do as a subgroup is to gather up some of this really good best practice that's happening right now and make it available uh, across the globe to, to different regions and countries. Over. Great, thanks. Um, I think we've gotten to the questions that are in the chat box. So maybe from my side, I'll take advantage of having the floor um, to ask a, a question to both of you. Um, I, was, I was struck by Esan's um, presentation about the challenges with partnership and the, yet the importance of involving both international and local actors, a diverse set, um, especially from the community. What advice would you give people who are working in the field on how to make that collaboration effective? Maybe um, if I can ask uh, Asan to start. Okay. Uh, 
at the ground level, what happens at the current practice in Bangladesh, okay, the international organizations or uh, whoever are uh, the UN, uh, they go with the uh, partnership at the vertical level and then they have their own partners. Uh, and uh, whatever the fund is mobilized uh, is channeled through their own partnership. Uh, so that is the vertical level partnering is working. So what we are trying to do is uh, whether in the same area, if there is a, a joint need assessment, the needs are coming up, or if there can be a collaborative initiative through consortium that I've explained. Uh, so they, the local organizations can deal that aspect. Uh, but it doesn't work if uh, the funding comes from a single organization and only targeted to their through their partners. So that is one gap we are seeing. The second one is saying challenging is that uh, so for developing partnership, uh, particularly the small uh, local organizations, uh, their organizational capacity uh, sometimes become a difficult for them to respond to many diverse types of due diligence initiatives. A requirement. So that is one area we have been advocating for harmonizing the due diligence process uh, around the generic requirements so that uh, the uh, local level actors can be capacitated to deal with that aspects. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Asan. You know, there was a, a little question funding in Bangladesh. Maybe you could answer that quickly. Um, and the question was whether or not there was an INGO led pooled fund in Bangladesh, and if so, how could local NGOs access this fund to respond to COVID-19? Yeah, thank you, you're just reading the question uh, from Nepal. Thank you for this question. Yeah. Uh, the current pool fund, only the example, which is a collective pool fund coming is managing by the Start Fund Bangladesh. The Oxfam has through its one of its project that tried to uh, humanitarian uh, HRGF, humanitarian response fund. Of that are also a kind of pool fund principle they piloted with that. So these are uh, these are for natural disaster, but for particular, I think the question is more particularly for COVID. For COVID, so far what we found from the pool fund, start fund for alert and call responses have been at that there. So other than uh, that, all funding from international organizations came through the partners, their own partnership. Uh, for field level operation. Thanks, uh, Asan. I, I see that we have a from the West Africa region online. And so I was wondering if I could invite Fabrice to uh, give us a little overview of how the ERP approach is being implemented in the West and Central Africa region. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy. And, and happy to, to contribute to the, this very interesting debate about like how we link uh, the different approach and particularly the, the ERP approach when it comes to COVID. I just have a very uh, a short contribution, just two main ideas that we've been developing in uh, Western Central Africa and that we are currently developing. Actually, we just finished an emergency uh, preparedness and response working group uh, uh, meeting just right now, We're just jumping in from, from those discussions. Just the, the way we use the, the ERP approach in, uh, in Western Central Africa is like, we have a couple of, of we have four countries which are really uh, uh, who have like a specific profile in, in the sense that they don't have necessarily a very uh, humanitarian profile, but they had to uh, develop uh, um, a COVID humanitarian response uh, in health and on health issues, and we thought like uh, uh, accompanying them at regional level would be quite useful to use like the tools, the ERP tools, and we adapt the ERP tools to engage the discussions with them with for, for, for non humanitarian. Uh, actor, not specific, and to drive them through the process of having this risk analysis to make the scenarios, to make also a, a specific uh, response that they would like to develop, and to accompany them also on the very specific operational readiness measures that they could take. And so we, we find the approach to be um, very specific and a little bit uh, uh, adaptive. So it was really appreciated by the four countries that we had the chance to accompany, which were like uh, here again, uh, non, non humanitarian countries. Uh, uh, usually, and that are now getting to to understand the way that they could approach this uh, this level. Um, a second example of the things we've just been discussing now uh, uh, in inside the the, the the emergency preparedness working group at regional level is we are now preparing for the for the flood. You know, with that in Western Central Africa, we have now a, 
uh, we are about to start like the flood situation that will be as we were uh, mentioning about the complex emergency we we might have uh, some country that will be uh, uh, developing uh, uh, several layers of, of complexity with conflict with the climate uh, issues and with the COVID now uh, taking place and the way we are we we approach a little bit the discussion is like COVID is a kind of operational reality which is like uh, of course, uh, that, that we need to adapt to, uh, especially in terms of operations. We know that now the, the support we need to bring to those countries is better how we ensure that the, the flood response that will need to be anticipated needs to integrate inside the design the specificities of COVID. So how we ensure so that the response will not be by itself uh, propagating more the, the, the virus that uh, is it at the moment and how we ensure certain security uh, and adaptations to those measures and that we need to mainstream inside the, the emergency preparedness plan. So now we are going to be revising all this uh, emergency plan, providing them, uh, uh, sorry to say, kind of COVID, uh, COVID friendly or COVID adapted uh, measures to integrate into. And this is how we, we are going to be developing the actions in the next uh, weeks. So that was like a contribution from Western Central Africa. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabrice. That was very interesting insight. Uh, now we're almost at the end of our, our one hour together. I would just like to invite uh, John and Asan to give us some parting thoughts. Um, if what are some key takeaways that you'd like us to take to retain regarding the ERP approach? I'll start with you, John. Sure. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so, look, I mean, again, I think it's been a, an interesting discussion and certainly some of the, the questions and, and comments that were raised. Look, ultimately, you know, what we try to always emphasize with the ERP approach is the flexible response focused nature of the uh, the whole exercise of it. What we've done with the ERP is to try to put that into a, a framework, uh, a logical framework that has a set of questions that are not necessarily exhaustive questions, but questions to get people thinking uh, at the country level. And you know, one of the things I think we always like to give as a sort of a, a takeaway whenever we're doing uh, workshops or briefings on this is, you know, if in doubt, think response. That is the key element to the ERP. Uh, is this an activity that is going to add positively to our response? If the question is no, then that's maybe not the thing uh, to focus on. So again, uh, to very much try to keep that in the front of mind, particularly be given that there is an opportunity cost. We all recognize that uh, when it comes to preparedness and, and readiness, but at the same time done well, it has a majorly positive impact uh, in overall humanitarian response. Uh, that would be it for me, over. Thanks very much, John. Any final words from your side, Esa? Uh, yeah, I think those, uh, uh great opportunity to share uh, the perspective as well as to get insights. Uh, I end up with, two, uh, with uh, uh, three key points that uh, would be uh, take, take away for us as well as we'd be requesting others to consider that one is whatever planning we make, we cannot do that in isolation. It has to be collectively done and the uh, uh, response also need to be done collectively. That cooperation collaboration is very, very important, uh, even uh, at the subnational level. Second is all the actors have capacity, so the whole capacity sharing uh, could enrich and the uh, add value, uh, which helps uh, uh, to make effective response as well as it may cost it cost effective. And the final one is about when we talk about full fund, I would uh, reiterate this. But it is not just the funding coming from external, it is both internal, including private sector engagement and the community's uh, contribution also comes there. So that again can be a collective effort, uh, uh, which will, will make it successful if we make the transparent and accountable. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So we've come to the end of our hour together. Um, just a reminder that this recording will be posted on the interagency standing committee.org website and information about further briefings are also posted there. Um, and our next briefing is Friday, 26 June on mental health and psychosocial support in the COVID response. So thanks for those of you who joined. And I think both John and Asan are available for bilateral follow up if you have questions. And I want to extend my greatest thanks to them for taking this time with us and all of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much. <laughs>